All righty, it is official. Good evening, one and all. I am Professor Jennifer Harrison Howard, and this is your exam to review for April quarter. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it and share my screen with you all. There we go. Zoom user, if you can go ahead and type in or, or change your name, there's a Zoom user. Recording. First and last name in the box, please. Let me just make sure here. Okay. Oh, I know you're a face Zoom user, but. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll put it in the chat. I, I okay. All right, you guys, let's just do exam two review. All righty, let me just kind of move the screen so I can see your beautiful faces. All right, so just a couple of housekeeping. Your exam two takes place next week and whenever your class time will be. Um, I, I teach a Friday class and so Friday morning, and then I believe there's a Friday evening section as well. We try to have to grade Friday Eve, everything is done behind the scenes. And as soon as I know, I, I post, um, this is being recorded. And of course I'm gonna share in my section. And then we also share with the other instructors as well. Um, as my folks know, as soon as I, I get them in from the instructors, I put it in a, just copy the link and put it in the announcements. So for exam two, we'll cover chapter 24, which is rural health and migrant health. Chapter 25, poverty, homelessness, teen pregnancy and mental health. Chapter 26, alcohol, tobacco and other drugs in the community. And chapter four, government, the law and political policy activism. The Faith Community Nurse in Chapter 29, Chapter 30, the Nurse in Public Health, Home Health, Palliative, and Hospice. And Week 5, um, your Chapter 8, Environmental Health, Chapter 10, Epidemiological Applications, and the uh, Occupational Health Nurse. All right, you guys, let's del delve in. So, if you can remember throughout this course, and especially on the on the test, those prevention levels that I know, again, in my class, I try to hone in and, and make sure folks really get understanding. If you come in with a solid understanding of primary, you come in with a solid understanding of what's secondary and what that looks like, you come in with a solid understanding of tertiary, and you always keep that in the back of your mind, and you think, okay, with this in mind, and these group of people, that's my population, whomever that be, migrant workers, teen moms, or what have you, um, whatever activity I'm focusing on, primary, and my, it's an education related where no disease exists. I'm not looking for a disease. I'm not a disease. I'm trying to promote health. I'm trying to prevent. Uh, I'm giving vaccines, I'm doing education and teaching. And then for secondary, if you can somehow just remember, remember the three S's, I guess, um, am I screening for something? I'm, am I looking for breast cancer? Am I screening for cervical cancer, prostate cancer, colonoscopy? Am I doing another S, am I conducting a survey? So, you know, I don't know about you guys, but in my doctor's office, they always have this survey, like in the past week, have you felt like it's in despair and they're doing that depression screening. If that screening is positive and you go on in that visit and become diagnosed with depression, now you're in tertiary. So you can move to tertiary and you have depression or di which is a diagnosis. You have obesity which is a medical diagnosis, you have something that you're, you're at that level and you will stay at that level. Even if you manage your depression with counseling, 
even if you manage your depression with uh, a plethora of medications or with psychiatry, you're on that tertiary level. And if you can keep that somehow in your in your brain of what those three things really look like, it doesn't matter what scenario gets thrown at you. If they're surveying, screening, surveillancing something, then it's prime, the secondary, excuse me, they're looking for something, okay? And if they're doing teaching and education on healthy foods and vegetables or giving out vaccines, then it's primary. If they mention anything about any disease, period, because you're always, you're always going to, I hope as a nurse, educate your folks um, when you're giving the, the diabetic, their medication, the side effects. If you're um, a chemo nurse and you uh, radiation therapy may cause nausea, vomiting, and you more than likely will lose your hair, you're still educating and teaching but that's not the level you're on. There's a disease that's in play that you are trying to help them manage so that it doesn't turn morbid. So community environments, okay. So you wanna review rural health when we talked about risk for um, and minority and races, looking at your vulnerable population and the fact that they're living in rural and poverty areas. So if they're in the rural areas, first of all, if you have children in the rural areas, a different ethnic group, vulnerable, but they have that added factor that they're children as well. So they tend to, uh, people in poverty in rural areas tend to have higher risk of chronic conditions, higher infant mortality, morbidity, um, shorter life expectancy, more complex health conditions. And that may all be related to a lot of different factors in your chapter talked about it. Um, lack of access to care, um, working sun up to sundown on the farms, the parents are busy, lack of education. Uh, these things tend to plague those in there that live in poverty. And then again, the chapter also mentions that the number of college degrees remains far lower in comparison to their urban residents. And that's just how it is, I suppose. Doesn't mean every single person in the rural area lacks a college degree, but when you live hours away from university and you're working all day long, um, that tends to be an issue. So they have more significant complications as a result of being uh, living in rural uh, areas. Hospital rates tend to be greater. All of those things tend to plague the, uh, those in poverty. And then you add on the fact that if you're dealing with children or certain ethnic groups or what have you, then that just makes it more of a complex situation. So going into uh, a little bit about our, I'm, I'm a visual person. So slides are great, but uh, when you're talking, it's like, okay, this slide to you. So the picture to me just says a lot. So if you've ever worked on a farm, I, I have, it's, it's strenuous work on you. It's physically and mentally demanding. But the text really talks about physical demands, specifically things to remember is um, if you're working 12, 14 hours from sun up to sundown, that's a lot of strain on your musculoskeletal system, on your spine, your back, and all of that. So back and neck pain tends to be more common as a chronic condition with many workers leaving or changing their jobs. But you think of folks that come, like in my area, Arizona, we have high number of migrant workers that come through as well. They the seasonal, um, they follow the crops or what have you. So key to remember is low back pain is called sciatica. It's consistent with a herniated lumbar disc, something just to remember. Um, so then when you're a public health nurse, you the, some of the things you're going to do, one of the things I would think of is that you're working with good body mechanics, teaching folks how to properly lift, um, taking breaks, um, being alert of their body and different signs. So even though you, you might think, okay, I'm a public health nurse, what can I do? They have to work, but there are things that you can do if you're out in the public 
and you're focusing on prevention. So you're doing primary, you're teaching, your education, you're showing folks, and there's different screenings that you can do as well. And if someone, you do come across someone that has low back pain and is diagnosed with sciatica, that's tertiary, getting them to physical therapy and what have you. And keep in mind, you're not doing everything completely and totally by yourself. So let's get into a little bit more about risk factors for clients in rural communities. Still talking about our rural folks here. So they're less likely to participate in leisure time, probably because they don't have a lot of leisure time. So then again, things that you can help them with is, again, if you're going out into to their community where they're working, you know, you can, again, teach them about wearing seat belts, which tends to be not so common in rural areas. This is per your text. So then you can always educate on prevention, prevention, prevention. You know that chronic diseases are more prevalent among rural clients. So that's something that they really tend to emphasize. And then again, rural communities, I grew up in a rural community and Everyone knows everyone or someone that's like not seven degrees of separation. Everybody knows everybody. So the hesitation of going into your local clinic tends to be things that are common. That's why I it's in red. There is a lack of anonymity because you know, I want folks to know your business among rural communities. And um, so therefore they're not really apt to come in with a sore down there or, or, or an issue because they think it's going to spread. So these are things to keep in mind. Again, if you're going out there, how to um, how to work with that individual to make sure that they get the health care they need. Because even if all of this occurs, they still need health care. So then building that trust with that community is the first thing you want, one of the things you want to do. Take a look at the slide here. Looking at primary, we're going to deal with secondary and tertiary prevention levels in regards to these healthy people goals for our migrant workers. So primary, prevent, okay? Prevent. Intervention should be focused on education and teaching so you can reduce the exposure. So that would be, again, you can have a group of, you know, group of workers together during lunch. They have to eat. You can provide education and teaching at that point. And if you're moving to um, secondary, remember is that word screening. So you already know if you see that word screening, they're looking for something that is secondary. They can put all kind of colorful little adverbs and adjectives around it, but it's still secondary. It is what it is. So then what you're gonna do is you're gonna provide, you can do hand washing stations, can, um, do your screenings, like usually what they do, uh, what I've seen, I'm gonna admit someone real quick here, is um, such that you can do urine screening for pesticides, certain pesticides. I've not personally done it. I know that it can be done. Um, you can probably check a lot of things in your urine, honestly. So that would be um, a secondary screen, a secondary intervention. If, I don't know, if, I was a public health nurse working for a, a, a farmer, a, a large farm, and let's say one person tested positive for a pesticide, and um, I would work with the health department, get some workers down there to help me screen because of that, for example, um, we've not had any positive pesticide exposure. So one is one too many, and so I would be proactive and get some folks down there to help me screen everybody. And then tertiary. So tertiary means a disease exists. And in regards to your migrant workers, you wanna think, okay, signs and symptoms or any, any again, you're out there. So it's not like you have um, like these tools, but if someone's diagnosed, you wanna get them to treatment regardless of what it is. But we're talking about our migrant workers and pesticide exposure. And so common things, a lot of different conditions, but again, we're keeping it simple. Nausea, vomiting, skin irritation. So those are things, if somebody is diagnosed with something, you want to help them to live the best possible, have the best possible outcome. 
with this pesticide positive result. All right. So moving on, chronic disease, rural communities. So again, the best thing that we can do for any, any population that's considered high risk or vulnerable is to live in the primary and secondary rural. However, if we encounter and there's chronic conditions that exist, we wanna get them into treatment, the therapy that they need. So what it says here is that um, when they do seek care, they have an overall decrease. And that's par for the course more, uh, it makes sense to get people into early treatment such that we never have to deal with a chronic condition, whether it's on a farm or in an urban city. So if you already know that you're gonna be assigned to a rural area and they tend to have higher rates of chronic conditions because that's what you learned about, you want to come in already like prepared and ready to go and start doing your assessments and what have you. But again, to remember for test purposes that chronic disease is more prevalent and prevalent means, who wants to tell me what prevalent means? I'm going to, I'm going to um, pick on Budala because I know him. <laughs> I know his name. <laughs> what is, what does prevalent mean again? Don't more break my heart. It occurs more. Yes. More, yes. Prevalent just means if you're looking at incidence and prevalent, new cases, existing cases, you already know that chronic disease tends to be more common. Just I always tell my students, try to exchange it for a word that makes sense to you. Like if prevalent, you know, people don't go around and say it's more prevalent. You know, it's more common. You, if whatever makes you stick that word and you can exchange it when you're in a in the middle of a um, exam, but common. Right. Why didn't they just say that? Because we're, you know, in school, we're supposed to use like prevalence and words like that. All right. So cultural considerations involving a Mexican culture is specifically listed in your reviews and what have you. So with, with this particular culture, what the text talks about is to consider that nurses are considered in in most cultures, you you know we are held in high regard. We're respected, um, and we we are known to be caring individuals. And so we come in with this already given authority uh, that we want to not um, abuse. And then again, keep that in mind that we already are coming in like, oh, you're the nurse, so we're, we're, we're held in high regard. So keep that in mind. And then for the Mexican culture, a couple of things to remember, well, most cultures, but for these guys, for Mexican cultures, you wanna, you want to sit down with the individual and allow them to just talk. Chit chat is what the, is what's listed here. This is something I tend to do anyway. I go in and I introduce myself, I just, folks start talking and start trying to build some type of rapport, you can kind of gauge it. But what you do is you don't want to get in there with this culture and just start doing things and touching people and doing that sort of stuff or what have you. They want you to sit down and spend some time with them. Before they already know what you're there for, but just let them, let them have a few moments of your time. So again, that's something to be aware of with this. You want to be polite and courteous and non-confrontational. Um, what else? What else? You want to, uh, again, with this with everyone, take your time, be respectful, appear that you're understanding and you're caring, nodding your head occasionally. Um, what, is, what did I hear somewhere? We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So just, you know, listen and validate their feelings. Again, this is specifically what, um, what you need to know, cultural considerations in the Mexican culture. And then anytime something is, I don't know, bold, red, it's really, really good to know. So homeless and challenges, I mean, the picture says a lot there. So it talks a little bit about um, the review, review mentions specifically single moms. 
the, the rates are increasing. They're stating it's related to a lack of education and poverty. That's what they're saying. Um, and so therefore, again, if you're working with single moms as well, you know this coming in. Okay. And then looking into poor teens as well. Poor teens, pregnant teens, homelessness is an issue when you're dealing with um, a specifically an issue if you're dealing with poor teens that are pregnant and homeless. I mean, that's just a lot to deal with. But again, you want to remain hopeful and positive because they have many challenges. And that's why you want to build your build your support as well. I used to have a list of resources and numbers for homeless shelters, shelters specific that take pregnant moms. So it's important to keep in mind too, if you're dealing with pregnant teens, we wanna keep them in school, get them back into school. Here in Arizona, and I think in most states they have, we have it underneath uh, one of the school districts here, an actual high school for teens, it's called TAP. Do you guys have TAP in your area? T-A-P-P, Teenage Alternative Parenting Program? We have it back home in Florida too. Sarah? We have something like that, but I don't believe it's called TAP. TAP. But we, they, they do have it and if they get pregnant. I think it's called PACE. They get to go, they get to go somewhere and be pregnant and still have a school. It's like still school. Right. Right. It might be PACE, but yes, we have that. Right, right. Well. Most middle to large um, urban area cities have some type of teen. And it's not, again, I, I don't want to beat it down, but it's not an alternative, like in, in Arizona, it's not an alternative school or charter school. It's actually underneath the school district. So they receive the same English one-on-one -on -one as if they were in school downtown for that district. So anyway, okay. And they are able to bring their children with them, the babies to school with them as well. They have daycare, they have WIC office located as well. I love that program. But the bottom line is that Homelessness, when programs that you, you want to get pro pregnant moms, homeless moms specifically into as many programs as you can, usually they're out there, but folks don't know about it. Why would they unless they needed to know about it? Um, so again, it's important to keep the pregnant adolescent in school during pregnancy and have her return as soon as possible so that we don't have that what? Lack of education and poverty cycle repeating itself over and over. And also important to remember that they are considered high risk. Keep this video, look at it over again, over and over again, when you have time and just pay attention to the, to, to, the, to everything. Um, so moving on to homeless again, I love my pictures, you guys. This says, bless her heart. She's doing the best she can with those ulcers, but I think it's gonna need some antibiotics or something. But again, homeless access to care, emergency rooms. Bless their hearts, if not, it's not like they have a PCP or health insurance. So they tend to visit the emergency rooms and usually the conditions are far gone or need urgent care immediately because things have tend to, you know, again, festered. Um, again, crisis oriented. Um, and therefore, what does that mean? The cost of services are going up high. But in the ER, I don't think you can refuse anyone in the emergency room as opposed to like a walk-in clinic. Think of prevention levels for your vulnerable population. Specifically, they talk about HIV. Um, okay, HIV, primary and secondary prevention. You, we know that by now. HIV is terminated through sexual contact or exposure to bodily fluids, infected blood, passage from the woman to her uh, unborn child, uh, considered high risk categories. Again, that wrote high risk is used vulnerable over and over and over again in population health. Again, those are two definitions along with the primary, secondary, and tertiary that you'll probably hear to nauseam over and over again. And that's not a bad thing. So individuals who um, are IV drug users, individual experience persistent and recurrent sexual infections, individual with multiple 
sexual partners are considered high risk. So again, um, partnerships and prevention. Pretty much this slide just says what, what I've mentioned multiple times. There's no way one person can, can do everything. You want to start, you want to build your partnerships. Well, in your career as well, you want to have partnerships and people and friends that, you know, you went to school with, they work at this hospital, that hospital, you can call up, ask questions, building that network. It takes a village approach, especially in public health. Now, when they're talking about mental health specifically, you want to prevent a culture of youth violence by creating coalitions and partnerships. And all that means is that you can bring in um, different agencies to come and talk to teens as well to help build those skills that they need to stop, think, and act, okay? Uh, they find that increasing social skills, positive social skills, and I always say, just keep them busy. Keep them busy, busy, busy. Volleyball, soccer, to have them doing something social when they're learning to interact and share with others and be nice and all of that stuff. Um, moving on to, I think we have like 40 something slides, but moving on to alcohol abuse prevention. Again, there's that prevention word. So from a primary standpoint, it looks, again, it's still going to be your education. However you want to put a spin on it, primary, no disease exists, okay? Dangers of mixing this, that, with this, and that, education, all right? That's how that looks. Secondary, you're early identifying, early intervention. So you can have secondary set so many different ways. You know, I thought you said it was surveillance. It is, you know, they're looking. They're still trying to identify. They're identifying through surveying people when they do those, again, those PHQ nines when you go into the doctor's office or my doctor's office every single time. Do you smoke? Do you drink? How much? How many glasses? How many a day? How many in a month? Early intervention. And so you're trying to detect. You're trying to treat early through screening, those three S's, screening, surveillance, and survey, however you want to remember it, if you want to think early identification and early intervention, that's fine. I like like easy stuff, three S's, surveillance, but they're still trying to identify something early, find breast cancer early, early diagnosis, early treatment, better outcomes, okay? Um, the disease process has already begun, maybe, we don't know, but the whole point is you still have to look for it. So that's what I'm saying. If you look for it and you find colon cancer, then you automatically go, where, Sarah? Help me out here. Don't let me hang me. You gonna let me hang you? Don't leave me hanging. That's Sorry, right. I'm trying to type at the same time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Message. Liar. 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 If you find colon cancer, you already moved to what? Textuary, the last one they have it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then you just, you go from there. You start dealing with things and what have you. Um, psychological dependence with chronic use tends to lead to increase the risk for violence and trauma, mental illness, genetic connections. But again, know how all abuse would look at every level. That would be just good to know. So I know these slides, I can probably make a hundred slides on everything, but a hundred slides is still a lot of slides. And you can always go back and look. Again, Healthy People 2030 looking at tobacco now, because we just dealt with alcohol and how would that the level. But again, if you have an understanding of, I keep like saying, saying what primary and secondary tertiary is, nobody can trip you up. It just can't happen. They can throw in, how does primary look at, so got this, right? All right. So you can provide education to teach them about healthy lifestyles, how to resist getting involved in alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, and educate and educate and educate. Okay. So secondary, we're trying to do early detection, looking, surveying. Um, so 
there's a reason which people can gather to determine presence of substance abuse. So they'll, they can screen for substance abuse. They can screen, um, do different screenings there, especially if they're looking for um, a particular substance. They can do it in urine and drug. Don't know if they're going to do it in a school, but it can happen. Drug screenings. And again, surveys. People really don't pay too much attention to surveys when they think, they think screening is screening. And screening is great, but because what you may be trying to do in your program, you don't need to do a drug screening. Maybe you want to do a survey and kind of slide in that way, do a survey of high schoolers, and they don't even know that you're doing secondary prevention. That sounds horrible, right? But but seriously, you can, I promise you, every time you do that depression screen, this, the, the, the depression survey screening, they're looking... They're looking for it's positive, then it they leads to other things and they start talking to you like, oh, you know it. Anyway, screening survey surveillance. And think of surveillance, think of like CDC, some guy with big glasses on, you know, what monitoring for the rates of um dengue fever and the in somewhere in Washington State. He's getting all this data coming in about E. coli and He's going to declare an outbreak on tomatoes and I don't know, but survey screening, um, secondary survey screening, uh, surveillance. So, and then tertiary, as far as tobacco is concerned, tertiary means that a disease exists, and it, so addiction is a disease. Okay, substance abuse is a disease. So then you have programs to help people reduce or end substance abuse because it is a disorder. So then again, um, if you think of the common high blood pressure and diabetes, you miss the other stuff like alcohol abuse and, and um, substance abuse, all of those are just, that's, an, a, that's a disorder. And so you, if you're diagnosed with that, you know, alcoholism or what have you, then you're tertiary and work from there. Because what we don't want people to do is like lose their liver, drink out their liver and all that kind of stuff when they're at that level. We just, we want them to live as long as possible. Cirrhosis that from alcohol abuse and what have you. If we could have just backed it up to secondary or better yet primary. So if that helps you kind of hone it in as well. And it's just, just know the dangers of nicotine and, and vaping. It's dangerous. Okay, so especially with, with young individuals, if they're exposed and they're still growing and what have you, um, we want to do our education and teaching starting, sometimes starting in the elementary school. I found cartridges on the playgrounds. I've, yeah. So then again, um, we know that is dangerous. We know that vape oils are poisonous. May, some people may think it's not as bad as this. And with you, again, um, you do your education and your teaching and you show and you demonstrate, okay, so this is what looks like that has been exposed to this. I, again, I would bring, I had this one model of, it was a big jar of tar and cigarette butts. I got from some company. I would take that out because again, you can talk to people, but when you show them, it's, it's now we're gonna, sh let's, let's talk a little about uh, congregation-based and institutional-based nursing. Um, when you think of a congregational-based uh, community health nurse, she is focused on that one specific church. Uh, usually I came from smaller churches back home. Um, and so we did not have that luxury and you don't see them every single where. Um, usually for larger congregations, they do. They go out and visit the members in, in hospitals maybe, or they, they do different programs, actually help focus programs actually at the church, but they're assigned to that particular congregation. Um, Institutional, just know the definitions. I would say institutional, again, 
she's faith she's she's working in the church but she's more of like um let's say um she works for the Lutheran services of Chicago, but she's not assigned to a church, if that makes sense. And don't really get caught up on the words. Just know that if congregational nurse, she is, that's what she does. She's like tunnel vision. She's focused on that church and the members and keeping those members happy. Whereas an institutional base, she may be a liaison working with um, a larger organization, but she's not out checking people's blood pressure every day or something. Okay, know the difference between religiosity, they want you to know it, and spirituality. This is easy slide because religion is a person's personal beliefs. Let's say they're Christian, they're Judaism, Hebrew, or no Hebrew, not Hebrew, but you get it. Um, and so spirituality, again, is your attitudes and beliefs, nature, and the like. So one is, is religion. I think we know, hope we know the difference. One is religion. You, you identify with a certain faith. And that's good to know. Again, if you, you want to know as much about your community, what is their if that's the case, learn, you want to know you're not putting your idea beliefs thinking and trying to change you. You want to know even on this level so that you come in with an understanding. All of this is for you to understand the folks that you're trying to help. All right, now let's get into our, our parish nurse. So, Again, going back to the congregational nurse, your parish nurse, again, if you're dealing with primary, how will, how will that look? How would secondary look for that parish nurse and how would tertiary look for that parish nurse? If you know your definitions and you know them well, she's still gonna be doing classes and some type of, some type of education encouraging activities, um, decrease video games, watch television. But again, nothing exists. She's really, it's the most beautiful form if we can all live in the country. Eat healthy vegetables. All of this might sound like you know this, but again, to reinforce it is one thing. And the habit come from the parish nurse kind of brings a little bit more authority to it where, I don't know, as a child, if you listen more to an uncle than you did your mom, or you had that authority figure, that parish nurse has that healthcare authority type of um, presence that folks tend to listen to. I don't know if you remember in our, in our class where we showed, I had that video where the gentleman was like, every time I think about my blood pressure medicine, I think of back up and take my medicine or something. So again, she's still doing that primary prevention with her congregation. She can do weight screenings because she's screening for obesity. Okay. She can do her heights and weight and look for BMIs. And then if someone is, um, has obesity, which again, these are just examples. Now obesity, people don't remember it, it is a medical condition. And so therefore it is tertiary. And then you're working on reducing the weight and complications because obesity can lead to high blood pressure, can lead to blood sugars, and diabetes and that. Because we don't want that to happen. All right, you guys, now getting into some of the, the, the Medicare and Medicaid, you really, really know your, um, know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Okay, that's just, uh, it's just, it is just what it is. Um, I think in my class, when I talk, I think of Medicare as caring for someone in need. So they have a need for skill care, they have a wound, they have something that, um, that demonstrates a need for that particular time. So it says here that because the nursing service must be considered skilled, and that's something you wanna, they keep repeating that. Um, you can't say we need 
apply for Medicare because we don't have anyone to care for mom at home or something like that. So they're really, really strict about um, what is needed, rehab and that sort of thing. Um, you, you don't want to end up with a bill because of this. So then again, Medicare, um, for those who are age 60 and over or disabled, it is a federal insurance program. So that means every, it's for Medicare, it's handled at a federal level. So that's good to know. And it's you, those who are 65 and older or disabled, but it's a federal program. So your Medicaid, think of it as a Band-Aid, is a um, usually uh, handled by the state. It's a, it is a state, it is a federal and a state assistance program administered by the state. So for, for us in Arizona, it's called ACCESS, Arizona Healthcare Containment System. Our Medicaid has a name. Back home in Florida, it was just called Florida Medicaid. But each state has their own spin on it. Are you guys familiar with your your particular? Um, do I see? I only see um, Miss Hoggy. Are you there? I only see a few faces. I don't know. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Are you? Hi, sorry. I only see a few faces. Show me your faces, Kendria. Judith, Jacinta, Daniela, Mayun. Okay, because this is recorded. Okay, I mean, I'll be sure. All right. Are you guys, uh, Miss Hockey, are you familiar with your um, Medicare for your area? For our Medicare, you said, or Medicaid? Medicaid. Well, Medicaid, I'm sorry. Medicaid. Uh, yes, I'm familiar. Okay. What state are you coming from? Ohio. Okay, okay. So every state has their, again, has their, they administer their um, Medicaid. But again, and it, it's bolded here, Medicare, which again, 65 and older, disabled, will only pay for home health care by skilled professionals while the client is homebound, whereas Medicaid does not necessarily require homebound status and may reimburse for home health aides and other non-skilled services. So, so you're like, why do we just, just know what will pay for what? That's what this slide is trying to tell you. Know what will pay for what. So just, just memorize it. I tell folks, just memorize it. Just memorize stuff. And if, if you should see it again, it won't look foreign to you. Let me just put this out of my way so I can do my little. Okay. And then. My little button here. All right, we'll do it that way. Okay. Okay. Medicare coverage. Let me get this out of here. I'm trying to move these things out of the way so I can see. Can you guys see the slides good? Pretty good? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Again, there has to be a need for the Medicare for the skilled nursing. And that's what they pretty much want to, to drill in. So there has to be a need. Um, you're caring for a new wound. Um, you're going to teach the family members. Um, you're not, again, you're not providing sitter services as well. And you do not want to get in trouble with Medicare or Medicaid. Let me just say that. So this is, is, of all the slides, I like this one the best, I guess. Again, I'm always a picture person. It tells you and I wish I could blow it up, but I couldn't, but it just gives you the difference on who's eligible, what does it cover, what are the costs, and the enrollment. So just go back and review eligibility, Medicare versus Medicaid. Medicare, 65 and older, people with disabilities, people with each renal disease. Medicaid, low income, individuals and families, you just kind of and just just know the difference between the two um it would be a good thing and then i don't know what happening to my little slide here all right let's just do it this way that's fine 
All right. So you guys, a little bit about the nursing process and case management. Just, just a few tips. Okay. So when you when you're going through with your um your you're managing your 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 patient at the home, okay. The first thing you want to do, of course, you you're coming in, you're identifying what your what your goal is. All right. So then you're working with the family, you're working with that family on that particular health issue, whether it be a wound, ulcer, diabetes, or what have you. So then again, you're coming in, you're discussing the health problems, you're doing your assessment, um, and you're coming up with your diagnosis. And just know how it flows. You continue to do your visits until you meet your goal. Um, you continue to work with the, uh, the family throughout this process. You're discussing their health problems. You're discussing all of that without the entire phase of things. And then the planning would occur after the outcome. So you've already met your goal. The, the wound is healed. The ulcer is gone. Um, and so that you, um, you've put a, you've wrapped up this case management piece when you've had a satisfactory outcome. And that's the only slide that really kind of talks about um, the case management piece of this. You can have someone in your case management services. And again, you're, you're managing all of this, um, but again, you're not, I guess what I'm saying, discharging anyone until there's a healthy outcome, the goal's been met. That probably goes without saying, but again, keep that in mind. So then when you're going out to your home, all right, and you're 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 visiting with them, you're sitting down, you take a look at the environment. You just you just take a look around and you can catch a lot of things just by observation. So when you're thinking of the the environment, the home health um, assessment piece, you're looking at safety, you're looking at um, the, is there any clutter, any, any um, medication issues, expired medications? Um, do they have their carbon monoxide? Um, monitors? Do they have all of that? And then usually I go out with like a checklist of things so that I just make sure that I get the, the basics covered if that, but I don't start like checking off, checking off. I just come in and I just let people start talking and, you know, introduce myself and what have you, but I'm always looking around. I'm looking at the environment. I'm looking at everything. So, I mean, do you find a refrigerator that's not working? Do you find that there's, um, the mats are not secured down and somebody can trip and fall? Um, it's a bathroom. Do they need those rails? Are the medicines expired? So that's that's what you're looking for when you're looking in the home environment. Um, looking for any hazards that are there. You're looking to try to, again, reduce all of those because you know that someone has, you know, a, 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 what am I trying to look for? Issues with mobility and those skid rugs. So these are the things you're keeping in mind. You wanna always leave your client in a, in a better state, if you will. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Those are some wonderful things that you can teach anyone and everyone or what have you. Um, and for environmental help and just for, for just because it's, it's a good thing. So keep that in mind, reduce, reuse, recycle. And then epidemiology, we touched on that in class today. The, the best, you just wanna just know your definitions. You just gonna have to memorize some things. I, 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 that's the best, that's the best thing you want to start off with. Start off by knowing your definitions and then trying to apply it. So you want to know the definition, definition of epidemiology, how it applies to infectious disease. So epidemiology on your slide is the study of the distribution and factors that determine health-related states or events in a population. 
and the use of that information to control health problem. So think of it as two folds. You're looking at, you're studying what are the factors that, that, that cause disease and how can you control those to the best of your ability as far as um, health related events. That's a good place to start. And then analytic epidemiology, because there's different little pieces that they talked about in that chapter. It was pretty, it was pretty heavy. You want to just start off by reading, looking at your objectives, and just taking it one bite at a time. So analytic epidemiology looks at the cause. So if you want to think of analytical cause, if that just helps you kind of break that down, determinants of health and disease. So how does it occur? Why are some people more affected than others? Who, what, where, when, how, why, why? That's that's a good place to, to start. Because then when you're looking at who are at risk for disease, for illnesses and disease, you know, oftentimes, I, I mean, have you ever thought, why is this person, they never get sick during flu season, they're always so well, and this, that, and the other. Individuals that have issues with their immune system. So if you're already coming in, you know that you have a that has um, lupus or some type of immune disorder, or not even that, certain conditions that put you at risk. Um, these are the things that will put them at higher risk for illness to begin with. Just like COVID came out and they have these high risk groups that should get this, 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 and this, this, and that, and the other folks on chemotherapy, cancers, and what have you. So again, when you're out in the community, because we're not at the bedside anymore, and you know that there's elders in the home, people that are have chronic, chronic conditions that attack their immune system, you already want to come in and make sure that everyone you know, gets their vaccines, this, that, and the other, trying to keep everyone as healthy as possible because they're already dealing with so many other things. We don't need to add the flu on top of that and what have you. But let's get back into this, this triangle. This is one of my favorite slides. I love this triangle, okay? So let's me, let's see. All right, can... Give me an example of, she's like, oh, you call my name. <laughs> Give me an example of, of environment when it comes to this, this lovely triad we got going on. You can unmute, my dear. A restaurant, like a, a cafeteria. Cafeteria? Well, yes. Well, a, a restaurant. We'll say that's the environment. Mm. Well, I should say in the kitchen, like the kitchen area where they're preparing their food. Okay. Okay. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like where they're preparing their food is an environment for these agents. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. Judith, you want to add to it? You with me, Miss Judith? Just like me, I can. Yes, there you go. You're muted. Environment. Yeah. Um. What comes to mind? Environment. Um, like workplace that work with um, um, I don't know what. Did you guys talk about it this week in class? Yes, I, we talked about it, but you got me. <laughs> Um, who dollar help her out? Water, thank you. Who said water? Leia, thank you. Water, the air, stuff like that. <laughs> the water, the air, the I don't know, the dirt, the everything, the soil. Um, and then. Agent, just look at the picture. So agent, you got your bugs and then your host, you got your people or animals. Because what happens is, is that with, you know, folks realize that epidemiologists, these are people that study epidemiology, is that disease is a complex relationship between 
the environment, the agent, and the host. So remember the environment, the air, water. If you want to think water, that helps you, that's fine. Agent, you can think E. coli, you can think COVID, whatever makes you happy. Um, hosts are people, animals, living things. So changes in one, and God forbid, many of these, if it's all three, I mean, but changes in even one of these can influence the disease uh, happening. Um, but then you can also think of it in a positive way too, that if you keep this host healthy, agents at bay, the environment with nice, clean drinking water, then you can decrease someone's risk of getting a disease. And if not, then you increase their risk. Um, that's, that's what you want to know with this triangle. All right. Is that any one of again, if you're a host and you're dealing with cancer and chemotherapy, I don't think you're going to have the best immune system in the world. So then it won't take much from the environment or the agent to get you sick. Okay, just keep that in mind as well. Um, as far as this triangle concern, it, it, it exists in a delicate balance. You keep the host healthy, you keep the water clean, you keep the agents away. It sounds simple, but again, I still have friends that have yet to get COVID, which is good you know, at all. And we all work in here, healthcare. I think my daughter brought her home. She tried to take me out. <laughs> just kidding. So a little bit more about just looking at this epi triangle. Let's look at the top, host. Spe if you want to get specific with it, again, yes, it's people. Yes, it's animals. But if you want to delve into host a little bit more, what is the immune status? What is the genetic program? profile why is race does it get involved in as far as some races are more susceptible they say because of genetics i'm going to get into all that females over men age like an easy one children babies and elders tend to be more vulnerable um nutritional status family background if you want to delve into not just host but what about the host and then the environment, temperature, global warming, water, milk, food, pollution, noise. Um, and then you look at the agent. The agent should be an easy one. That's your viruses, your bacteria, those sort of things. And um, but just know what the host, what that would entail. That would be something living, humans, animals. The environment, if you want to think of water, food, that's fine. Just, just ha know the differences between the two. The agent should be the easiest one, okay? And so diseases produced by exposure of a susceptible host. The host has to be susceptible. Susceptible means that I think of it as that you're, you're, that person is vulnerable by whatever means listed in that you know, listed in that category for host, again, I the easiest thing to remember is if they have issues with their immune system. So if they have to be susceptible and vulnerable, you want to use that word, to the agent, let's just say E. coli, in the presence of the environment as well. So they have to ingest that agent and their food and the and somewhere it has to, it's in the environment, but the person. But anyway, you host your aging environment. We got that? Yes, yes. Know it, know it. Now, again, we're looking into a little bit more about the data and how that's, how that looks. Your chapter really delves into uh, the different rates and so I'm just gonna go over a few of them. So you're looking at case fatality rate. Some of this, again, all of this, memorize it first and then be able to apply it if you see it again. So face, pay the case fatality rate is the proportion of persons diagnosed with a particular disorder, your cases who die within a specific period of time. So think of your case fatality rate as the estimate of the risk for death 
within the period for disease. So I, for me, I memorize and then I try to think of an example that I can remember. So I want to say like rabies has a high fatality rate. I think it's, I don't want to lie, it's like 90 something percent of the people that are infected with rabies don't survive. But how many people do you know that ever died of rabies? I don't know of anyone. But I'm just saying some diseases have a high fatality rate. Diagnose with a particular disease with, um, they often want to know, you know, what's, how, what's it look like? Doc? Well, you know, the case fatality rate for rabies is not so good, but we're doing the best we can, sir. Just kind of thing to keep in mind. All right. Um, it's the estimate of risk for death within a period for a person newly diagnosed, so newly diagnosed incidents. So go back and look at the slide. Ecologic. So ecologic, does anyone remember or ever hearing about John Snow and the cholera out in London? Or am I the only nerd? If you subscribe to my YouTube channel, no, actually I have a video on there. For all 10 of my subscribers, seriously. So ecological is like the quickest, down, dirty, easiest, inexpensive study. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the ecologic. So the ecologic, um, you want to understand the relationship between outcome and exposure. So when John Snow back in, I don't know, he's known as the father of epidemiology, I think. He's considered to, to have done the first ecological study. So what happened was folks were dying of cholera. And so he used a map of the deaths from cholera to determine the source was from a pump on Broad Street. And do you know what this man did? Do you know, Sarah? Let me tell you what he did. He removed the pump. So he did. He removed the pump on Broad Street. So, okay, so people were dying of cholera. Okay, he used a map to, I guess, pinpoint. I'm thinking him like circling. I don't know if they have high alerters back in the 1800. Circling, and he was like, the number of deaths from cholera in this area. And then he was like, he pinpointed that it came from a pump on Broad Street. I don't think there were pumps water pumps like all around. I'm sure like there was like sections, you know, just how the water flowed. I don't know. There wasn't a pump around every corner. And he just literally removed the handle. That's all he did. He removed the handle and people stopped dying of cholera. It was only when like later on that this guy discovered um, chaos pot. He's the father of something. It wasn't until he literally the pump. That's ecologic, quick, easy, inexpensive study. That's what I'm trying to get to. Um, but anyway, and he, they, Koch, K O C H, Dr. Koch found out that it was actually cholera transmission that was okay. Anyway, so that's your ecological study example. Then your cross sectional. So your cross cross-sectional is your descriptive type of study. Um, think, I'm trying to like, think cross-sectional and prevalence. So there's a plethora of different studies out there and images in your text. What I would do, of course, is read your text because I have read your text. And then I would try to make it make sense to me. So then when I think of cross-sectional, I think prevalence. I wouldn't use a cross-sectional study if I'm trying to find incidents, which is new cases. So if you wanna just micro it down to cross-sectional prevalence, those two words, when you see them, that would make sense to you, okay? And then it looks, so the cross-sectional, again, it looks at snapshots or think cross-sectional, of a population, like you're trying to cut and look at this group of people with this disorder. Okay, helps. 
hopefully that helps. So um, retrospect, retro, looking back in time. So retrospectives are really fun. A lot of people get their dissertation using retrospective study. study. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, you got the kitty cat behind you. Feed the kitty cat, Sarah. So retrospect, you're looking back. So then on, you, you do look at the records, at the health departments, insurances, hospital records. You're not dealing with any live people. It is still a study. Retrospect. You're looking at the, you know, things have happened and then you know, outcomes have happened and you're looking back in time and you're doing a uh, more of a, I don't know, existing data are examined to identify risk for a particular disease. And people may have died or what have you. You're studying them, a group of people at the fact, a group of people that was exposed to Ebola in 1992, what was their, what did they share in common? What did this happen? This, what were their symptoms? This, that, and the other. So it's still a risk. It's, and that's your cohort of people. Cohort is just a group of people or what have you. So that's another type. Folks, no, IR, no IRBs are needed. You don't need permission from, you know, well, you yeah, have permission, but you're not dealing with living, breathing people at that particular point in time. Let me see. All right, so now moving a little bit into your occupational health. Doesn't she look like hard at work there? I just love so your occupational health nurse, we have one here on the reservation. She handles of different employees. She's working with, um, you know, prevention on, again, your primary prevention. She's working with um, noise reduction, things that can cause trauma, preventing uh, accidents or handling accidents as they occur, looking at chemical storage, chemical hazards, and that has to do with trying to have the best possible healthy, happy employees keep the workers safe. So if you're at Nike, if you're at Amazon, they probably have somebody at IBM. I'm quite sure, Bill, I don't know. I'm assuming that sort of thing. Um, Pre-employment pre screenings, workers' comps, that sort of thing. That's your occupational health nurse. She might be, she might work at a trucking plan, production plan, or that sort of thing. So then again, this is a specialized type of public health nursing, community health nurse, nurse is assigned to a group of workers, whether it's 50 or 100. And it's usually the large organizations, they have more than one person and what have you. Again, when in our class today, I, I went over that, we talked a little bit about that and showed a video of them, patient health nurses in, um, in the middle of their jobs and explaining what they they do. Again, how would that look primary? How would that look secondary? How would that look tertiary? Primary is still primary. Secondary is still secondary. She's screening for this or that or the other. She tertiary, you know, blessed in our hearts. Somebody is working in a mine and got cold poisoning. I don't know, mesothelioma. Is that a no, that's something else. You get what I'm saying, right? Okay. So primary, secondary, tertiary is still primary, secondary, tertiary from the occupational health nurse and her workers. She's trying to keep these workers safe. A lot of workers sick and out of work. That business will go pew. So, so for example, for that one, because yeah. I know you said it doesn't matter what kind of nurse it is. It's still primary, secondary, or the other one. So primary, say, wear N95 mask if it's like asbestos or something. All right, I guess secondary providing screenings to see if they have any, I guess, like cancer. You can screen and them then, for COVID. Okay, let's keep so it, let's keep it on. Yeah. Let's keep it on that level. Wash your hands. Don't come to work if you're sick. Please stay home if you have a fever, if you've been exposed. Do education and teaching on washing your hands, getting your booster. Have you gotten your booster? No, you haven't gotten your booster? Let me get your booster. That's primary. Um, education, teaching, education, teaching, 
Health, no disease exists. You're not looking for something. If you're swabbing somebody for COVID, you're looking for something, you're screening them for something. You can do a questionnaire, you can do a survey, not for COVID. Or, well, I guess if you're like screening them, you're screening them before they come in, that would be that would be um, secondary. And then um, tertiary would be bless their hearts that 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 employee that's been in an ICU for 10 days from COVID and intubated when they get out, getting them, they're probably gonna need rehab. I've known some folks that, anyway, get over that. Yes, so that's that's how that would roll there as well. Your, um, your, your teaching them how to properly use that machine or, or wearing their gate belts or wearing their equipment or, you know, you have a hole in your, did you know you're not supposed to wear your, I'm just talking, you're not supposed to wear your N95 the entire week. <laughs> you're supposed to change it. People, people were like, what over happened? I'm hanging around the, the thing. Made my, ugh. Mm -hmm. And you would, and you'll find out in nursing, like you don't want to insult people. Like, don't you know, but you have to like, you have to learn to have, just have some coof and just be so delicate with it. You know, mask be all down here, all down here, not covering anything you're supposed to cover at all. If I'm telling you, you're fogging up and I could, you're fogging up in your glasses because your mask is not fitting right. Um, let me talk to you for a minute here. Um, let me just, you know, you're, you're, you 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 got to get that really good fit. Oh, it's too small. Did you? Oh, you didn't get fit tested. Why did you come to my house and get fit tested? So I get your mask. Okay, yeah, that's primary. And then secondary is like, you know, I don't feel so good. I have a tickling back in my throat. Let me go ahead and swab you. Come on, let's swab you. And then, you know, you have COVID. So that's tertiary. You stay home, isolate. Please do not come back to your fever. Okay. So again, she's for the occupational health nurse. She's um, dealing with, oh, we have someone coming in. Okay. We're, we're looking at all these different potential hazards. Okay. She wants to make sure that she's keeping this, the equipment is, is working properly. Folks are taking their breaks. Folks are getting hydrated. All of these, all of these things, she's literally trying to, and again, she's not working by herself. She's probably working with safety officers as well. But, but again, keep the employees at work happy, working effectively so that everybody can thrive and have a job to come back to. The plant doesn't close because everybody got sick and that sort of thing. It'll affect the economy. So again, Vaccine clinics for flu shots is primary. Healthy snacks and vending machines is primary. Teaching people how to properly lift and uh, equipment, lift things is secondary. You can do screenings like help for insurance. Um, insurance screenings, if she has to do that, or screenings that she's doing, um, or surveys or any type, again, surveys, screenings, surveillance. She's trying to tertiary, she's trying to minimize complications, reduce the risk so people are not missing work. Productive, the company's productive. It's not about the company, it's about the people. The people are the company. But again, if profits start going down, people are out sick, nobody will have a job. And so there you go. And then let me see here. Okay. My slide is okay. My slide is good. It's fine. So again. Every, at any, there's a hazard uh, uh, material they're required to have. Uh, the occupational nurse make, needs to make sure that there's MSDS, material safety data sheets, is regulated. She has to have, so any, she needs to just make sure it gets into the, whatever book. I remember working, we had, we had our MD, uh, MSDS sheets that you can look up things and information on a particular hazard, not every single day, but it's mandated by law that if there's um, hazardous, uh, hazardous material there that they have to have the information sheet available for it. It cannot be changed. 
and it must have one for every agent on site. That's just how it is. Um, and then OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Occupational Health Nurse works closely with the rules and regulations for OSHA. That's just her, her go-to, just like if you worked at a health department, you may be on CDC a lot because that's the national level. And then OSHA is that national standard for occupational health um, regulations that she has to make sure that it's being followed down from OSHA. So setting and enforcing safety standards in the workplace, prevent work-related illnesses, injuries, promoting, enforcing safety, keeping people safe, safe, safe. They pass down the regulations that the an, a, occupational nurse needs to make sure that she and everybody follows. They actually also offer, OSHA offers education and outreach assistance, whether it be on their website. So that's her go-to people, okay? So it's important to know what is contained in the vehicles and um, what is contained in different spills and treat spills. So she'll contact them and go through whatever, if there is a spill, let's say she works for some transportation or trucking company. That's the Department of Transportation. I've moved on. So they're really good as well as far as to, um, to being transported. Uh, and then what else did it, the National Institute of Health and Safety, they're, they're the guys that do a lot of research and education from that standpoint, um, respiratory diseases, construction workers, and inhalation of particles, they do a lot of education from that standpoint. And so she will, this, these will be the organizations that to, you know, make sure that she's familiar with where to find information. Because that's whatever you're doing, whether you become a chemo nurse or a nurse, there's always these organizations and national this, that, and the other that you just want to be, I don't want to say a member of because they can be expensive, but you should be able to go to the website and find your information. For me, I do a lot of CDC. I do a lot of my health department. And from there, I can probably go to other sites. But you you just, depends on what you're specializing in, if you specialize, you just got to know where to find your information. So in relation to occupational health nurse and healthy people, these are the list of um, objectives and focuses that, um, that they that is tailored for occupational health, working with um, deaths. I mean, duh, <laughs> we don't want anybody to die. We especially don't want our workers to die. Uh, work-related, reducing work-related reduce in illnesses, reducing this, reducing that, reducing work-related assaults because violence happens at work as well as any place, I suppose. Um, and then making sure that people have to different programs to prevent or reduce stress. I know we have like 1-800 numbers that the occupational health nurse can refer us to after she does her, I guess, her assessment or what have you. So just know those different um, objectives for that are occupational health focused. And then going a little bit into your um, the role of the environmental health nurse, we talked a little bit about in our class today. She does a lot. I mean, any specialty type of nursing, they that's why they're specialized because they're the trusted source of information. And so they tend to be the subject matter experts. Um, how to assess those hazards. If you're working in environmental health, you, you should come in having an understanding of how to assess hazards, provide that information and communicate it to people, educate them, um, help them help develop different school-based, work-based programs, depending on where you are, um, helping those professionals with um, getting the information they need so they can avoid harmful this, harmful that. Uh, you're working always, anytime you're multi, you're specialize, you're working with different multidisciplines. 
your collaboration. Again, you have to. This one person cannot do everything, but you got to know where to find your information. But again, just know this, uh, just know the information for environmental health. Again, they're writing policies and legislation about environment. I've I, I've written a policy, assisted in helping write policies for different things in, in public health as well. So they, they will expect you, if you're a subject matter expert, whether it's public health, school health, you're going to be involved in writing and changing policies. That's just how it is. You're the, you're the expert in that. Look to you for that. And you help facilitate 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 behavior change in people. You cannot change anyone's behavior and make them do anything. Help them. And when they are ready, then you you meet with them and you 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 meet them along the way. But folks have to want to to make that change. So again, that's the role of the nurse in environmental health. Again, we're talking about working with um, the Department of Health and Human Services. We're also reducing pesticide exposure, blood levels in children. Um, we're working with um, reducing toxic uh, pollutants released in the environment. And all of this is, is, again, you're not doing every single thing. You're working with this group of, of individuals at the state level, local level. You're getting them on board. You're being involved with different organizations to help, try to help make this happen. Again, these healthy peoples are usually 10 years of, um, they change them every 10 years or what have you. So you have 10 years to try to make a difference. And again, these you, anytime you're going into whatever you're doing, even if you're working with a patient at the best side, you should have some type of goal in mind by the end of that shift. That person will be pain-free. That person will ambulate down the hall. So you, you want goals for your population that, that are achievable. Not, you know, everybody's going to take a flight to Pluto. That's not realistic. So again, just environmental health, there are healthy people that you want to have an idea of what that looks like. And again, um, they talk about um, increasing the number of school policies. Policies are really important with um, policies, I guess, gets helps to get things done. When folks see a policy written, that tends to mean that it's important. So again, um, you may be called upon to assist with that. I'm really good on getting things started and getting the research for people and having someone put it all together and have it make all part of the any type of public health nursing you're doing. You're not only physically doing education and teaching, but behind the scenes, there usually is some type of policy that's written um, for folks to kind of carry out after, after you're gone. So again, when you're looking at how, look at how the environment um, can impact somebody's, someone's health. Again, I'm a visual person. So folks are working out in the fields or what have you. How's the climate change? Hot, too hot, cold, this, that, and the other. How is that affecting him, affecting the population? What about, are they being exposed to um, any pesticides while they're out there working? What about how are the roads? How's the food? What about hygiene and water um, sanitation? Um, noise, occupational risk. So then people who are exposed to risk factors in their homes and workplaces, these are some of the things that they can be exposed to that you can, within you know reason, try to work with as far as, let's just say, housing and roads and what have you. If you want health risks are... Think of them as factors that can cause disease or injury if you're exposed to them at your home, your work, or your community. So you want to assess for any source of unintentional poisoning, let's just say mercury. Um, what can you do as far as um, your folks have proper help with 
um, sanitation, connecting with the different departments in the area, health departments, if you can. You want to work on um, how people store their food, their medicine, things you do. You can't control the climate, but what are things that you can do to that's within your power to do? You can coordinate with other folks to try to reduce, can't reduce every single risk, but what can you do? You can work on the hygiene part. You can work on the, the roads. You can work on the foods, coordinate with different agencies and get them in there and get them down there to the farms to help things out as well. And so talking a little bit more about the environment, you want to look at um, this particular picture it just shows you different exposures and how that really looks, I guess, from the home perspective. Uh, not every single home, but again, older homes tend to, if you're, you're going to a home that may have um, risk for paint that contain, you know, lead paint, have high risk for paint containing, um, like I said, the lead that may um, cause developmental delays. There are still some in my area. There's a there's there's quite a few older homes and what have you. And again, there's nothing wrong with them, but depends. These are things you want to do your research on beforehand. And so you go and also look at safety measures. How can you keep people safe? Is the pool gated? Do they need alarms? Do they need security cameras? That sort of thing. So the home environment can be the best possible place for them for folks to thrive. And just touching a little bit on hospice, hospice, this screen is not wordy because hospice is end of life care. It is, you're not extending life. There's usually certain protocols in place. You know, you have a, a terminal condition with, in this area with the less, a year or less uh, life expectancy. I've known people to go to uh, be in hospice and to, graduate from hospice. Not often, but it can happen. And then to come back in months or years later. Just remember, end of life quality care. Okay. So it's end of life quality care for a terminal condition. So there is no primary. There is no secondary. Okay. That's never going to happen in the hospice case. You're working with the family as far as what they're going to see as it as things, how you know their family member may exhibit signs of this, that, or the other, um, realizing that it's comfort measures, pain reduction uh, efforts. Um, if mom or dad is not drinking, you're not putting in an IV sort of thing, and just realize when folks realize that they that when they're going into hospice what it looks like and what to what that should should be dying in their home whether their home is a physical house or I was a hospice nurse and an assistant in a nursing home that was their home but end of life care quality care comfort not sending things um and helping that family um, along the way. And so changing a little bit into, moving into different agencies, federal aid that um, community health nurses tend to, to go to for information. We talked about CDC a lot, World Health Organization. The Agency for Research and Quality is a government agency as well. It's underneath the Department of Health and Human Services. And um, I tend to use this a lot when I'm looking for different, um, you can look up quality indicators like um, falls and um, what else? Gosh, fall prevention, um, it escapes me. Ulcers, different, different indicators that you wanna compare to and, and look and see how your particular agency is doing or your hospital is doing and meeting these quality indicators for the best possible patient care. I don't know. Produce evidence to make healthcare safe, qual higher quality, 
more accessible, equitable, equitable and affordable. And NIH, National Institute of Health, they do a lot of research in that particular federal entity. CDC, Centers for Disease Control, we know about that as well. There's many different centers that do many different things on a prevention national level. Uh, it's a great place to find information for your different case studies, hint, hint. And then HRSA um, Health Resource Services Administration, I believe that's Okay, so um, they also have education and funding for healthcare professionals as well. Um, a good place to look up is if you guys are, I know uh, several of my students at another university, they, they have HRSA loans that they work in a uh, uh, low-income clinic, reservation, as well. But these are different federal agencies that help with community nursing. And you guys, it's been an hour and 30 minutes. I did not realize, I just looked at the time. You are resilient. You're going to do on your exam. I am going to officially stop sharing and just wrap up this piece of the, um, and I'll take your questions. But let me just go ahead and say that concludes exam two review. Um, study well, take time for yourself and family, and um, we'll see you again soon.